you can get. So we're going to give you a double header and we'll, we will lead off with Reverend Kennedy giving the invocation. Thank you, Dick. Just a quick word before I give the invocation. In this season of giving and thanks, all of us sitting in this room, of course, we're hoping that the third game of the World Series might engage the local nine. But in the spirit of generosity and giving, you need only look at the front office and the lineups and the management of the two teams playing. We are very generous here in the city of Boston. And so no matter whom you root for, you cannot help but win. Let us pray. O oh God, creator, sustainer, and redeemer, and the author of our salvation, we thank you for the gift of life and for this day. We thank you for having given us powers equal to our tasks, not tasks equal to our powers, for giving us strength, courage, faith, and hope to lift up others less fortunate than ourselves so that they may come to know of your grace and love. We thank you for this gathering and especially for the family and individuals we honor today, the Leary family, Senator Paul Kirk Jr. and James Judge. As we recognize them for their accomplishments, May their lives of service and generosity inspire others to expend their reach beyond their grasp, that we all may live lives of service, generosity, and humility. Grant that we may be strengthened in our purpose and call to serve one another so that in so doing we may serve you. We come now to this season of thanksgiving, giving thanks for all those lives drawn from far off shores, and especially thank you for our freedom to assemble, to speak freely, and the great responsibility to vote, a gift so precious we must never take it for granted. As you hold us to account for the use of all our powers and privileges, guide us in the election of our president, senators, and representatives, that the rights of all may be protected and our nation enabled to fulfill its purpose. So finally, we thank you again for those we honor, for the gift of their lives and ours, for this land and country which has bestowed upon us such opportunity and freedom. Help us to do well the work you have given us to do, for the good of all and for you. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. And now, Father Conway. As we continue to pray, Lord God, we acknowledge that the food we share this day is a gift of your creation. Our Irish ancestors were refugees in this country. Their strong faith and hard work has enabled us to enjoy the gifts that we have. Guide us to always be ready to share your gifts with those who go without. May we always be caring and welcoming to the millions of your children who are refugees in our world today. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Well, here we are for the seventh time. Uh, this dinner gets bigger and this luncheon gets bigger and better uh, every year. And that's because we have terrific people who are running the show. And I would like now to uh, introduce the chairman of this year's luncheon, uh, someone who is a great friend of all of us and a great friend of the Irish community in Boston and a great friend of so many grand causes. Would you please welcome Bill Riley? It's nice to be here. At this stage of life, it's nice to be anywhere. <clears throat> Welcome to the uh, seventh annual Boston Irish Honors Luncheon. This event was founded in 2010 as a way to celebrate the contributions of Irish American families and individuals who have brought honor and distinction to the city and region for many decades. The Boston Irish reporter and co-founder Ed Forey conceived the honors idea, an uh, extension of the newspaper, and has strived to do so, so since 1990, to chronicle our history by telling the stories of people, stories that are often untold. The hallmark of so many honorees through the years has been humility and loyalty sort of a reluctance at first to accept this accolade. In a way, this common reaction is what makes these people and families so deserving. They embody the quiet dedication and a steadfast work ethic that has driven the progress of the Irish in America, and especially here in greater Boston. As the years advance, it is increasingly important that we acknowledge those among us who have excelled. They remind us of the accomplishments and sacrifices of our ancestors, some of whom arrived on these shores at a time of great hostility toward immigrants. It is a foundation that they laid so sturdily that gives us cause to celebrate on this day. Our honorees today are Senator Paul G. Kirk, Jr., Jim and Mary Judge, and the Leary family, Joe, Kevin, Mary, and Elizabeth. We salute them and we welcome you to this annual observation of the best of the Boston Irish community. If I may, I'd like to uh, reiterate the notes on a wall. People are unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, People may excuse you of being selfish with ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you'll win false friends <clears throat> and true enemies. Be successful anyway. When you spend years building, some could destroy it overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, others may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today will be forgotten tomorrow. Be good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you have anyway. In the final analysis, it is between you and God. It never was between you and them anyway. On behalf of the Boston Irish Honors Committee, welcome today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Well, enjoy your luncheon. We'll be back to you uh, in a few minutes with, uh, with a terrific program. Thank you very much.
girl and stop to talk of a fine topic. Let me ask you, friend, what's a fella to do? Cause her hair was black and her eyes were blue. And in a rubbing, I'll be taking. Uh, you know, the fact that you're here, this is, is important. You people are, uh, are an important part of the workforce. Not only in Boston, but in America. I'll give you an example show you how important you are. There are 320 million people in the United States today. 120 million of them are children or in school. They're not in the workforce. 85 million people are retired and no longer working. That brings us down to 115 million people in the workforce. 50 million people are in the hospital or otherwise incapacitated. That brings us down to 65 million, 48 million people are with the federal, state, and local governments. You can't count them in the workforce. That brings us down to 12 million people. Ladies and gentlemen, the population in our prisons today is 11,999,600 people. That leaves 400 people in the workforce in the entire country, and they're all right here in this room. And we're hanging out at the Seaport Hotel. Nobody's getting anything done. Well, the World Series is going on, uh, as uh, Tom Reverend Kennedy uh, mentioned uh, earlier, and it's really the uh, Red Sox Alumni Association that's uh, uh, that's playing in it, but uh, the Red Sox gave us a pretty good run this year on their own until they crashed and burned a month ago. But uh, we got an especial treat out of uh, Big Poppy's historic final year. <laughs> Start carving the statue, get the site ready right on the sidewalk between Yaz and Teddy. He's king of clutch hitters, fit him for the crown. Get driving instructions to old Cooperstown. He's our Hall of Famer, he'll get there with ease. The Pope will proclaim him St. David Ortiz. <laughs> to us, he's Big Poppy, we love it that way. The Big Pop's in his bat when he saves the day. Other teams fear him from east to west coast. He launches those big bombs when it matters most. On the day that he is installed in the hall, Sox Nation will be there, his fans one and all. And when that hall plaque is put into his reach, we pray that he'll launch no F-bombs in his speech. <laughs> Thank you very much. Speaking of the Red Sox, it was 30 years ago this week that an innocent ground ball went through the legs of Bill Buckner, which led our great friend, uh, the great reporter Marty Nolan of the Boston Globe to famously observe, the bastards killed my father and now they're coming after me. <laughs> the uh, presidential campaign is at last into its home stretch uh, I say home stretch because that's how we're trained to think. Reporters and the commentators are constantly using sports metaphors to talk about politics and political campaigns. And it led me centuries ago when I was doing political commentary to develop a, an alter ego character called Biff Flavin. He was a stereotypical sports reporter. He had a rumpled coat, he had a, a fedora hat with a press pass in the, in, in the brim, and he talked a little bit like Howard Cosell. You remember Howard Cosell, that blowhard of a self-important person? And he was the stereotypical sports reporter, but he, but he spoke about politics and government using sports metaphors totally, and often getting mixed up. And this, and this is how it sounded. Hi there from ringside use politics fans, Biff Flavin here with an ace up my pants. 
I'm making a pit stop, I'm filling, pulling both laws, I'm mixing and matching my sports metaphors. They're in the home stretch and the bases are full. They're blitzing the passer, he's throwing the ball. It looks like a slam dunk and they're neck and neck. The ball is in their court, it's all hands on deck. They're in the no huddle and there's a low blow. The count's three and two as they go toe to toe. It's a marathon race but the clock's running out and I don't know what I am talking about. Biff Flavin reporting on sports metaphors, up with the people, and also up yours. <laughs> so much for... So, <laughs> so much for uh, sophisticated political satire. Uh, now let's get right down to uh, business, because we have some uh, important business to uh, take care of uh, today. To make our first uh, presentation, uh, I would like to call to the stage a, uh, a uh, co-worker of uh, our, our honoree at, at Eversource and a longtime uh, friend of the family. Would you please welcome Joe Nolan. Joe? That's certainly a tough act to follow there. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am thrilled to be a part of today's celebration, honoring Jim and Mary Judge, Senator Paul Kirk, and the Larry family. You can't imagine what it took to elbow Jack Connors out of the first slot. Uh, I had to do a lot of uh, working there, uh, and we've got ads lined up for the next 20 years in the reporter. Uh, I just hung up from uh, Mara Cahill, Mary's mother, and she wanted everyone to know, she couldn't make it today, but the paper of record in the Cahill house and at Eversource is the Boston Irish Reporter. So I want to let everyone know that. I don't know where Mike Sheehan is, but the Globe is out and it's the reporter. You know, Jim Judge is my current boss. He's not a co-worker. Jack is my former boss, Jack Connors. Uh, they both, uh, ironically, had tremendous luck having me uh, working for them. <laughs> and what they both will say to you when you ask about, you know, Joe and getting into the company and how to get in there, they both will say, unscripted, he took the test and he scored the highest, and that's how, that's how he got in there. And that's the party line. Um, I can't think of a more deserving couple to get this recognition from the Boston Irish Reporter. You know, it's, it's a great American love story. A young man marries his best friend's little sister. They work at the Edison and they live happily ever after. And that's how it went down. I want to recognize some of the real greats uh, that have received this award since 2010. Obviously, the Hunt family, they're my dear friends and I want to congratulate them. Boston Mayor Marty Walsh, Mike Sheehan, Joe Cochran, and the Bob Feeney brothers, uh, all greats, so all deserving. We gather here now at well over 400 strong to say thank you to these leaders and their families. Thank you for your humble commitment to, to the Boston region and to the Irish community. We gather to share their story and recognize the immense impact that they've had on business and in public life. When it comes to Jim and Mary Judge, my wife, Therese, who's here with me today, and I have had the pleasure of calling them dear friends for 25 years. We have watched over the years as our families have grown up and grown out. They are the proud parents of four children, five grandchildren, and one on the way. They are joined today by many special family members. We are also blessed to have Jim's parents Catherine and Jim Judge here with us today. So can I have a round of applause for them? And, and what I've come to know and cherish about Jim and Mary is that they, they, their love is constant and it's true. Their love for family, their love for community, and their love for folks abroad in Ireland is tremendous. Their motto, family and faith first, it's a personal model that they hold dear, and I think one we can all aspire to put into practice. Together, Jim and Mary have always had a generous heart, giving in spirit, 
fiercely proud of their Irish heritage and culture through and through. Please join me in a round of applause in welcoming Jim and Mary Judge today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, there's nobody, nobody better than Joe at kissing up to the boss. <laughs> but in, in, in all seriousness, uh, Mary and I are truly humbled and, and honored to be singled out here today. Um, we'd like to thank uh, Ed and Bill, Maureen, Forey, and the uh, Boston Irish Reporter. Uh, wonderful publication, you know, proudly family owned and operated. The, uh, the honor is particularly flattering given the, the uh, company that we're in. Some of the names that Joe mentioned, as well as our federal, uh, uh, fellow honorees here today. Senator Paul Kirk, who's given a lifetime of achievement to uh, public service, and the Leary family who've done so much for, uh, for uh, furthering the relationship between uh, Boston and Ireland. So thank you for your, your service and your contributions. Both Mary and I have been uh, so fortunate to grow up in uh, very stable, uh, loving homes with Irish parents uh, with wonderful values. We both grew up in St. Peter's, Dorchester. Uh, <laughs> half the parish is here, I think. Uh, the the uh, <clears throat> obviously a tight-knit Irish uh, neighborhood. And to this day, our closest friends, our dearest friends are the, the O'Riordans and the, uh, the, the, the McDonough's, the Conroy's. Kennedy's, Bill Kennedy's here, Joe Renahan is here today, the Shays, the O'Briens, all uh, Irish families that above all else treasured uh, family, treasured their Catholic faith and their Irish heritage, just as we do. Both Mary and, uh, both of Mary's parents actually came from Cork City. And my mother's family, uh, the McCarthy's and the Kennedy's also came from Cork City. And, my mother will be the first to tell you that the McCarthy's were the kings of Ireland. <laughs> and if you uh, look at the history, actually in the Middle Ages, it was the McCarthy clan that, that ran the land. So if you remember nothing else about my speech today, remember that the McCarthy's were the kings of Ireland. <clears throat> you know, on the other hand, uh, my father's folks came from a village called Lahaden at the foot of Mount Na uh, Nathan. And um, I always fashioned myself, actually, as a, as a male man. And uh, no surprise, but it made it very difficult around all these Corkonians. They don't, they don't make it easy. Uh, in fact, Mary's got some cousins coming over for this weekend for a shopping spree. Uh, uh, lucky me, huh? <laughs> the first time, uh, first time I met the cousins, one of her cousins, Mary, said to me, um, she actually shared this wisdom with me. She said, do you know the grandest thing about York County Mayo. It's the road to Cork. <laughs> I knew then and there that all of our trips to Ireland would be based on Cork City, and uh, Mary has promised that I'll, uh, I'll get back to Mayo at some point, eventually. It seems like eventually never, never comes, honey. But we'll make it back. Um, I lived 26 years in a three family on Stonehurst Street with my father playing the Irish accordion, my mother who's got a great voice, uh, she knows all the, the lyrics to all the Irish favorites. And both of them uh, made it a, a point to uh, give to people in need. Uh, and they still do. Uh, my father always supported the church, St. Vincent de Paul. My mother was the uh, volunteer school librarian for many, many years at St. Peter's School. Very active in the Catholic Daughters of America. She was the one in the neighborhood that went uh, door to door uh, soliciting uh, donations really for anything that found its way into our mailbox, whether it was the American Cancer Society, uh, the uh, Heart Fund, disabled vets, you named it. 
uh, got to a point where I'm sure the neighbors uh, knew enough to break out their wallet when they saw her coming up the stairs to the porch. <clears throat> um, I definitely married up, as they say. Uh, I truly married into a, a wonderful family. Uh, Mary's parents, Jack and, and Mara Kale, they uh, left behind huge, loving families back in Cork City, and they came to, to Boston uh, to make a better life for themselves, and uh, they, they clearly did succeed. Uh, Mary's grandfather, uh, Mara's, Mara's father, was a, uh, a hero in the uh, 1916 Easter Uprising. He was uh, the fight for Irish independence. Uh, as a result of his service there, he actually uh, got, got sick and died at a, at a young age. He died too young. Uh, Mara was 12, had seven younger brothers. Uh, life could not have been easy. Uh, yet, if you meet Mary's mother, you'll never meet a more positive, caring, and thankful person uh, in life. Came to this country, raised nine children, uh, with her family all remaining back in Cork, as I mentioned. She's an amazing woman with faith that's uh, strong and, and passionate. A quick story about her father, uh, Jack, who, who passed away in uh, 2009, unfortunately. Just about 40 years ago, I just started dating Mary, and I, I stopped over uh, to, see, uh, to see her. And he had just got laid off. Uh, 19 and a half years, he worked for a steel company. And back in the early mid-70s, you had to have 20 years for a pension. So just shy of a pension. Uh, there weren't the, the worker protection laws that we have in place today. But you can imagine the stress. Nine kids all living at home, three in college, uh, high school tuitions, um, you know, uh, a lot of pressure, I'm sure. Yet that one day, it was a holy Saturday. I was uh, walking in to see her, as I mentioned. And Jack was heading out the door with a, uh, a baked ham that Mara had cooked for the homeless at the Pine Street Inn. So uh, that, that moment uh, has stuck with me. Uh, it shaped me to this day. Uh, despite their financial uncertainties, really financial crisis when you think about it, they continued to give to others less fortunate. Uh, he was a generous man with a heart of gold. Now being Catholic and Irish, the, the Kales, like the judges, were taught to share their good fortune with others. And that's exactly what the family expects of you. I'm happy to say that uh, it's still alive and well in the family DNA. Um, for 20 years now, the Cahills, led by Donald Cahill, who's here, have uh, provided 100 families with uh, holiday food. We have uh, turkeys, hams, pies, all the vegetables, all the holiday groceries. We go back to our old parish in St. Peter's. Uh, the sisters of uh, St. Teresa of Calcutta have a convent in the corner of Bellevue and Quincy Street up in our old neighborhood. And we're there uh, as a family every uh, Thanksgiving uh, and every Easter. So uh, it's a wonderful tradition for the Cale children and for the grandchildren, and we'll be there again in, in just a few weeks. You know, thinking back to my days at St. Peter's growing up, you know, a successful career was one of three things. You became a Boston cop, a firefighter, or if you were truly lucky, you got a job with the Edison. <laughs> to think to that, that today I have the awesome responsibility of running the Edison, now called uh, Eversource, it's really uh, remarkable to me. We're now the, uh, Eversource is now the largest utility in, in New England with 3.6 million customers. We have uh, 8,000 dedicated employees who I think are the best and the brightest in our industry. The core values that Mary and I share from our Irish heritage and from our family traditions, I really see embodied throughout the, the fabric of Eversource. They work hard day and night for our customers. We're fiercely commi uh, committed to building stronger and better communities. Whether it's finding a way to lower costs for customers or delivering a more sustainable energy future for our children and our grandchildren, <coughs> we care about making people's lives better. So uh, that is today's Eversource, and I'm so proud to lead it. In closing, I would like to uh, have the, the family stand to be recognized. We did fill a few che chairs here, as you'd imagine. Uh, all the, the Kales and uh, so the judges, our children, the spouses, the spouse-to-be, uh, if you'd all uh, please stand to be acknowledged. We love you dearly. Thank you, and as you can see, I'll be paying for a few pints later today.
on be <coughs> behalf of Mary and, uh, and I, thank you once again for this wonderful honor. And more importantly, more importantly, thanks for continuing to tell our Irish stories. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Mary. Our next presenter is an old friend. He's a former state representative. He's currently CEO of the New England Council. He and his family are past honorees at this great luncheon. Would you please welcome Jim Brett? Please, please be seated. No, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> My notes said, asked them to be seated. Um, let me just begin by thanking uh, <clears throat> Ed Forey, the Forey family, for uh, doing what you're doing each and every year, uh, taking time out and recognizing some extraordinary individuals that reflect so well on our community and our heritage. And today, you've outdone yourself again by uh, recognizing the, uh, the Leary family, who do so much for so many people, day in and day out. But what I admire about the Leary family is how they do it in a very humble, unassuming way. Uh, but they have touched an awful lot of lives, and they've done an awful lot of good. And uh, I'm very happy to see that they've received this very special recognition. Uh, Jim Judge, as soon as I heard his name, I said, St. Peter's, Dorchester, he's our candidate. I don't want to hear anything else, uh, how well he's done. We know that, and Mary's a wonderful lady. He's Dorchester. Say no more. And are we proud of him and what he has accomplished in this great company and uh, another well-deserved recognition. You heard um, earlier from Father Doc Conway gave an invocation. Father Doc Conway and the recipient I'm about to introduce were grammar school classmates the Walnut School in Newton. And story has it, in the fifth grade, Richard and Paul were sitting together. And Mrs. Murphy said, Paul, Someday, you're going to be a United States Senator. And Richard, someday, you're going to be in the sixth grade. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> I'm going to confession Saturday. First of all, this is a uh, treat to be asked to introduce one of the finest people I know. Paul Couric has had a very long and distinguished career in both the private and the public sectors, most of which is well known to you. He was well prepared for that career by his education at St. Sebastian's School, which explains why he is such a straight arrow. He ended Harvard College and Harvard Law School. In the private sector, he's had a very successful career as a lawyer at the Boston firm of Sullivan and Worcester, where he was a partner for many years. More recently, as the chairman and CEO of Couric and Associates. His work in the public sector has been long and various, from Senate aide to United States Senator. He served the National Democratic Party in a variety of ways, notably as its chair in the mid-1980s. He was instrumental in the original and continuing success of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library. This kind of career doesn't happen by chance. It comes as the result of hard work and dedicated purpose. It 
comes to those who not only have the ability, but also the necessary character to work hard, cooperate with others, and pursue the greater good. Paul Couric has succeeded in his private and public endeavors for three reasons. First, from his earliest days campaigning for Bobby Kennedy, he's always been a conscientious and committed citizen, willing to put in the time and effort to work through electoral politics and otherwise to promote the general welfare of his fellow citizens. Second, he is and has always been a true gentleman who has stood as a sterling example of how courtesy and respect for others, including opponents, are in the end enabling and not limiting. Finally, he has always been a steadfast and loyal, and I underline loyal, friend. Quietly, firmly, and honestly, Paul Couric understands and lives up to the demands of friendship. That trinity, if you will, has been the secret of his success. Committed citizen, respectful gentleman, unwavering friend, and Irish to boot. Paul, we could use a, a few more like you in politics today. We may not be able to do much about that in the short run. What we can do, however, is celebrate your example. And that's what we are doing here today. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, the Honorable Paul Kirk. Thank you all uh, so very much. I just want to refer to uh, Jim's story about Father Doc. All you need to do is look at his collar. And that's all you need to know about who of us exceeded the nun's expectation. <laughs> As they say in the ad, it's not complicated. Um, so Dick Flavin is the only guy I know who is both alive and well and is already in heaven. There's a guy who's got an Emmy to his credit, a world Red Sox ring, got the best seat in the house in Fenway, has a microphone in front of him. And uh, I'll tell you this, Dick, if, if Theo is as smart as I think he is, you may be on the next plane to Chicago. Um, after Jim Brett's warm introduction, I should know enough to quit while I'm ahead. But uh, Jim is the definition of a generous humanitarian 
in the strictest definition of both those words and every day of his life. And I thank you for the bragging rights to call you my friend, Jim. Ed Forey, publisher, historian, and founding father of this event. Uh, we're all in your debt for reminding us to stay connected to our roots. Yeah. The Larry boys know what's going on. If you folks want to fully appreciate why I feel so privileged to be inducted into the Boston Irish Hall of Honor. It is simple. It's because I understand that this selection process is guided by the values and the lives and the examples set by the Floreys and the Bretts and so many others. And to be included in the company of Jim Judge, the Larry family, and so many prior honorees is as good as it can get for this Boston Irishman. And what I want to do, if I could, is just turn the tables and ask you to acknowledge with me the thanks for those who inaugurated and continue to make this a living memorial for those of us who share our heritage. The hallmark of this luncheon is to share the stories of those on whose shoulders we stand. My parents, like so many of yours, were a part of what Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation. My mother was Josephine O'Connell. In the 1850s, the O'Connell family with six children emigrated from County Cavan to Lowell, Mass, where five additional siblings were born. In the textile mills of Lowell, where the O'Connell family worked, and in the grammar schools, they were deliberately demeaned for their Irish heritage and openly ridiculed, ridiculed for their Catholic faith. My father's mother quit the mills and became a Lowell firefighter. The youngest in the family joined the priesthood and became the first and longest serving Archbishop, Cardinal Archbishop of Boston. When William O'Connell became Archbishop, the same bigotry uh, what he underwent as a grammar school boy was still prevalent in the no Irish need apply Boston society. Historians credit him for the establishment of quality Catholic schools and institutions, which effect was to draw the Irish Catholics out from the dark shadows of discrimination into the sunlight of full citizenship, where they found social and economic justice and where they were able to contribute to the civic commercial, professional, academic, and religious life of our community. A new day had dawned in Boston. The Irish were included in social gatherings on an equal status with the Puritan Yankees. There was only one clear difference. As those gatherings appeared to come to an end, the Yankees would leave and never say goodbye. The Irish, God bless them, on the other hand, the Irish would say goodbye and never leave. <laughs> now, can, we can all relate to that, I think. Rolling the tape back to the 
early 1870s on my father's side. My grandfather, John Lennon Kirk, left County Louth all by himself at age 14. Talked his way along aboard sailing ships and worked as a crew hand, and later as a stoker of the fires in the ocean-going steamships, and eventually made his way to East Boston, where he met my grandmother, became a United States citizen, and raised a family of nine boys and five girls. You can imagine that supper hour, right? The tenth child of Paul Grattan and, I'm sorry, the tenth child of John and Maud Ann Kirk was christened Paul Grattan to honor the name of Henry Grattan, an Irish patriot and parliamentarian. And honor him, he did. My father was president of his class at English High School, commandant of the Greater Boston Schoolboy Cadets, a graduate of Harvard and Harvard Law School, an officer in the Massachusetts National Guard. At a young age, he was appointed Commissioner of Public Safety for the Commonwealth and later to the Superior Court of Massachusetts, from which he took a leave in 1941 to take command of the 101st Infantry Regiment, formerly known as the Irish Ninth, a part of the 26th Yankee Division, and led them into World War II, leaving behind my mother with three kids. I was the youngest of the three. She was also pregnant with a fourth. The fifth, Eddie, the player to be born later, is here. Uh, but I would say that mother was my father's strength and our heroine of the home front. She was the neighborhood air raid, air raid warden. She rationed our food. She knitted those old heavy woolen olive drab sweaters to be sent overseas. And she made sure that Santa's Christmas gifts reminded us of the importance of service. A nun's habit and a nurse's uniform for my sisters and a soldier suit for me. What I would say is that as a lonesome and concerned single parent. She lived the gospel values. She led us in prayer every night. She wrote her daily pal, a daily letter to the pal she missed, and she was there for us at every turn. When my father returned from the war, he rejoined his duties on the Superior Court and was later elevated to the Supreme Judicial Court. His entire life and career was one of public service. It was his example that taught me that public service is never a sacrifice. It is always an honor, and an honor to be performed accordingly. History teaches that heritage and destiny are oftentimes linked. Of the hundreds of times I have driven onto Columbia Point and passed a pump station, I am reminded that that was the last job that John Kirk had before he died. He was a land-based land -based engineer, and he operated the so-called Castle on the Point, the pump station, which at that point was located on an old cow pasture on Dorchester's Columbia Point. When I drive by that structure, I never fail to think or give thanks for the links the individuals and the choices that were made that shaped my life in direct and significant ways. My mother and father, my grandparents, obviously. 
the ethic of teamwork and brotherhood that's ingrained from students at St. Sebastian. And the final lesson that every Harvard grad reads, exiting Dexter Gate. Depart to better serve thy country and thy kind. And right on. And certainly not least for me, was the inspiration, inspirational and patriotic call of the first Boston Irish Catholic President of the United States, who in that same address reminded us that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. Answering that call introduced me personally to the wise counsel of a Tip O'Neill, the loyalty of a Kenny O'Donnell, the passion for justice of a Robert Kennedy, and to the tireless tenacity of the fourth and last surviving Kennedy brother who went on to become the greatest legislator in American history and who I was proud to call my friend for over 40 years. That call also introduced, answering that call introduced me also to so many of you whom I would never have known and whose friendship I treasure. Our family's gifts were not material in nature. They were intangible lessons of life values. Examples of faith and patriotism and inspiration and a willingness to serve and try to improve some cause larger than ourselves. They are also the blessings of four wonderful siblings. A close family enlarged in love by the addition of the Clary's, the McDermott's, the Loudermilk's, and the Miller clan. And for those who wonder what blessings could come for political associations, I remind them that Gail and I met working in Senator Kennedy's office in the good old days when compromise was what politics was all about. We got married and we've been compromising ever since. <laughs> and it's worked pretty well for the first 42 years. There is little any of us can do to repay our forebears. But if we do what's necessary to pay it forward, like the Brits and the Forries, and to help encourage those who are seeking their own inclusion in the American promise, there's a reasonable chance that we will have led a life of purpose that our parents and grandparents might have enjoyed celebrating. And I can tell you this, if the O'Connells and the Kirks of the past generation could have been present at this celebration, I like to think they would have been polite enough to say goodbye. But I am absolutely certain they would not want to leave. So it is on their behalf as much as mine that I thank you so much for this Boston Irish honor. Thank you, Paul. Our final presenter is a, is a true legend in this uh, community. Few, if any, can match the success that... Dick, thank you very much. Great to be with you all. Just to uh, give you the good news, the dinner menus will be handed out in just five minutes. <laughs> this is... Uh, there's a lot I have to say uh, about the Larrys and about others, but before I do, I'd be remiss if I didn't congratulate the Seaport Hotel for being the low bidder for, for today's luncheon. And, and it 
also like to suggest that the centerpieces go to the oldest person at each table. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have one distinguished newspaper that's uh, sponsoring this. We have another that's represented here today with the great Mike Sheehan, the CEO of the Boston Globe. We all know how we feel about the Boston Globe. Mike, we're happy to have you with us. I think it was the great Senate President Bill Bulger who said it best. The globe is the herald with verbs. <laughs> I'd like to uh, congratulate Joe Nolan on his 10-year extension after that extraordinary. <laughs> that was really something. And uh, I could go on for hours saying good things uh, about the judges, especially since they've had the sense of humor to hire our son to do their advertising. I think that was an extraordinary example of your great judgment. Uh, and to see two gym judges here and your beautiful mother, who was apparently quite a singer in her day. Over in Killarney many years ago. But I digress. This essentially is the difference between a Harvard graduate and a Boston College graduate. They're bright, but they can't sing as well as those of <laughs> from Chestnut Hill. Hi, uh, Jim. You and your family, very special. Congratulations. I mean that sincerely. Paul Kirk, Gail Kirk. I had the privilege of working alongside Paul uh, on occasion uh, with Senator Ted Kennedy. and. Uh, particularly towards the end when the senator and Paul asked if I would help raise $100 million for the, uh, the Institute for the United States Senate, which stands today cheek by jowl next to the, the wonderful President's Library in Dorchester. And uh, Paul, I know firsthand how the senator felt about you. And in fact, he told me on more than one occasion that you were the finest person that ever served in his career. And that's quite a statement from quite a guy. Congratulations to you. Sir. All of these wonderful comments, speeches, and attributes that have been mentioned remind me of that great story of the, uh, the wake uh, where a gentleman had passed on, a senior in age, and as the people came by to uh, express their condolences to, uh, to the widow and her four children, uh, the widow, after three hours of hearing these incredible things about her recently deceased husband, turned to the oldest son and said, do me a favor, Johnny, go over and be sure that's your father they're talking about. <laughs> We, I, I had a very interesting experience this morning. I had the privilege of introducing uh, Mayor Marty Walsh uh, at a Beyond Conflict meeting on racism at, at MIT. And uh, there were a number of very distinguished speakers, uh, one of whom mentioned, uh, and I thought it was very encouraging, that the brain is indeed flexible and adaptable. And uh, I have a number of my close friends that I need to share that with, given the current election situation. I'm glad to see there's so much compromise, as Paul said, and flexibility and adaptability uh, between those on the left and the right. It's very encouraging for the future of our country. So uh, speaking of flexibility and adaptability, I, uh, and by the way, I mentioned MIT because I thought maybe that might impress two or three of you, but I see that it hasn't had any impact at all. <laughs> Okay, I was driving on Memorial Drive, right? if you want to know the truth. So it is my privilege to say a few words about the Larry family. And uh, I'm honored uh, and grateful for the opportunity to do so, uh, because they're my friends. Uh, we, we don't spend a lot of time honoring people. Uh, there's, if you listen to the morning news or the evening news, uh, there's a great deal of criticism and comment about the failings of one uh, candidate or another, one family or another, one person or another. 
Uh, it's no wonder that we don't necessarily get the very best candidates to run for the highest office. People say, is this all we can do? We got 300 million people here and these are the two best we can come up with. Well, you try going through that, uh, that walking on chuckles that the, the two candidates of major party are going through right now. But we don't spend enough time uh, speaking about the good that's in people's hearts and the good works that they do. And so to have the Irish reporter take this uh, opportunity once a year to do so, I, I, I commend the Fouries and, and all those that are part of that organization. I've known uh, really two of the Larrys for 50 years, Joe and Kevin, and I, ever since I met them, they've been saying great things about their two sisters. So to the Leary family, God bless and congratulations. But I must say that um, the one that I really spent the most time with was uh, early on in my uh, time as a uh, big shot in healthcare. Did I mention that I was a big shot in healthcare? I've, I'll get into that after dinner. Uh, but uh, Kevin uh, and then his son got deeply involved in a little startup called uh, Valley Parking of New England. Uh, before that, Joe had a very distinguished career, not uh, well before the Irish-American partnership with the Gillette Company. In fact, when Hill Holiday was started in 1968, our second client was Joe Leary, and it was just an extraordinary experience. A wonderful opportunity, thank you, Joe. Uh, Kevin began this company, and the first big contract he had an opportunity to, uh, to get was at the Brigham Women's Hospital. And as it turned out, I was chairman of the board of the Brigham Women's Hospital. And as you can imagine, chairmen of boards don't have anything to say about anything. They just show up for board meeting. But in this particular case, on that particular day, I encouraged the management to give the contract to Kevin. And uh, I mentioned to Kevin, this is very simple. I think you're gonna get this, but don't, don't let anybody down, particularly the patients as they come into the hospital. And for the last 25 years, his people are among the finest trained in the industry. And uh, I've had a chance to watch Kevin and Mary build a beautiful life together. Uh, they, went, they went through, each of them went through the challenges that all of us have presented in life. Uh, and you know what, they came out the other side uh, as an extraordinary couple that Eileen and I are very proud to call among our dearest friends. Um, the Learys have, like the Kirks and others, like the judges, there's a little something special, a little secret sauce in the DNA of these three families that makes them committed to serving others. And uh, I've never seen anyone do it with more artistry and with more sincerity and with greater compassion than the Learys. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege uh, to introduce the Leary family and ask that they come up.
you're supposed on. to do. You're on. He's on. Our Larry family would first like to thank Ed Forey and his wonderful family for the honor of this recognition. Ed Forey, Bill Forey, Maureen Forey, and their family all-star, Linda Dorsina Forey, have done much to enhance the Irish experience in Massachusetts, <clears throat> more than they themselves realize. It's not easy to publish a newspaper these days, and they publish three of them. Jack Connors is truly a remarkable man. And with all his successes, where did you go, Jack? He is one of the most caring, sensitive men that I know. Been a Leary family friend for over 50, well, over 40 years. Thank you for your kind words, Jack. Mo most of them were lies. <laughs> the first Learys in our family came to Boston from Ireland April 18, 1870. They arrived on the, on the steamship Palmyra, uh, all the way from a tiny village in West Cork by the name of Inchigila. My great-grandfather, Dennis Leary, was 28 years old, and his wife, Margaret Callahan, aged 25, arrived with their daughter, Ellen, to a Boston we would not recognize today. They lived down the street at 147 West Broadway in South Boston. Their son, our grandfather, Michael Joseph Leary, became a Boston fireman. He and our grandmother, Catherine Agnes Fennell, also from West Cork, were married at the Cathedral of the Holy Cross in 1901, which had opened 25 years earlier to serve the growing Catholic community. Grandfather firefighter Michael, after being assigned to Ladder 1 in South Boston, died four years later of his injuries, suffered at a fire over near South Station. My dad, Joseph, was born in 1903 on Birch Street in Roslindale. That's your hometown, Jack, is it not? Um, the, the reason they were there in Roslindale is because Michael had received an injury to his chest, and they were told to move to a warm, dry climate away from South Boston. <laughs> That's the true story. Later, Dad met our mother, Mary Frances Nolan, when they both worked at Filene's. She was of the Waterford, Roxbury, Jamaica Plain Nolans. They were married in 1932 and moved to Jamaica Plain where they began their family. Um, Eighty years later, you see their four children here today. They have nine uh, grandchildren something like 20, you hear them. I don't know how many there are here, but you hear them over here. Certain parts of Boston have not always been welcome to Irish immigrants, but for most of us, it has been a very successful journey. I was lucky enough to work for South Boston's Gillette Company for nearly 30 years and then for the Irish-American Partnership for 28 years in downtown Boston. And boy, am I tired. <laughs> Brother Kevin and his son built a massively successful business centered in Boston. Both Sister Betty and Sister Patsy went to Ursuline Academy on Arlington Street, if you remember when it was there. My mother had a great deal to do with the location of, of Ursuline Academy and the family is still very active in, in the, the new Earthline Academy. Uh, Roseanne, is, the president, I believe, is here. And my sister Pat is being honored next week by Earthline. Patsy managed the Admirals Club at Logan Airport for many years. She nearly became Mayor Kevin White's personal travel agent when she was there. He would call up and try I need a three o'clock to Washington, D.C., and Patsy would get him a fine seat. Sister Betty was a nurse at the old city, Boston City Hospital, and today keeps a close eye on all of us. 
We all graduated from Boston College within six years of each other. The Larry family are very proud to be Boston people and very proud to have been a small part of Boston's great Irish Catholic tradition. Our sincere thanks for this honor. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you the founder and keeper of the flame of this grand event and the publisher of the Boston Irish Reporter, Ed Forey. Thank you, everybody. This is year seven. With the help of God, there'll be a year eight. But isn't it special to hear these stories? I mean, aren't these stories wonderful? Can I do one thing? Can I bring up the Foreys? Bill, Linda, Maureen. Paul, when you spoke about public service, when you spoke about public service, you know, my aunt was, my aunt Kate, as our, my family is down here, my aunt Kate was John McCormick's secretary from 1947 until he retired in 1970, and she, she used to go in and do his dictation for the couple years when he still was retired. So we grew up in the McCormick side, the other side of our original Dorchester, I'm sorry, our original Democrat, Democratic divide. We were McCormick's, you were Kennedy's. We're all in the same bed now, which is great. <laughs> my son Bill, my daughter uh, Maureen, and my daughter-in-law, Linda Dacina Forey, we welcome you today. We welcome you back next year. Thank you. I should say, we're going to ask the, 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 the honorees to go over here for photos, the family and bring your friends over. We're going to set up in the corner, and our photographers will be over there to take some official photos. Thanks a lot.
to say, Tom, this has been an auspicious occasion. It's a delight and a privilege to be here. The Corey family is going to be commended. Well, the speeches were fantastic. Uh, true Irish uh, heritage celebration of links of family and uh, an inspiration for future generations. A very good event. And we want you to stay well, Tom. <laughs> Don't be copping out on us now and again. <laughs>
always great to be here again another year. This is the seventh year of the Boston Irish Honors and it's so awesome that the Forries, the Boston Irish reporter, Ed Forey, Bill Forey and Maureen has created this incredible event and it really started with Ed. And I have to tell you this is amazing to hear people's stories because you know we see these families, we see individuals every day but we don't know you know, well, where is it that they came from or what was the passion that got them where they came, where they are now? And as a member of the Forey family, I'm Linda Dorsina Forey, I'm just honored really to be part of this incredible family that continues to remember their roots and really to recognize the Irish community here in our great city of Boston. Seamus Judge, say hi. Daddy-o. I love you. Hi. I know. Hi, girl. Uh, she's lost it. You say hi. Hello. Hello, I'm, I'm Joe Leary. I'm um, retired as president of the Irish American Partnership. We had a wonderful day today. Ed Forey and his Boston Irish reporter have done great things for our city, and we were very proud to be associated with it. Thank you. Kathy Kenny. Betty Horrigan. Pat Dowling. Mario Tool. Jenna Leary. Nora Leary. Annie Leary. Matt Leary, I'm Kevin's son. My cousin. I'm Jay Horrigan. I'm Betty Leary Horrigan's son. And congratulations to all the honorees today. Oh, okay. Hello, this is uh, Bill Kennedy at the Irish Honors Award. With my friend Jim Cahill, whose family was uh, on it today. And uh, thanks to the Fouries for a wonderful afternoon and a wonderful celebration of our Irish heritage. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jim Cahill. I'm here at the Irish Awards Luncheon. Uh, it was a very special day for our Cahill family, as my brother-in-law, Jim Judge, was honored, as well as my sister, Mary, and Jim's parents were there. So the Fouries did a fantastic job, and I was just very happy to be here and be invited. Thank you. Congratulations, Joe. Congratulations, Joe. Okay, okay, Judge. Kathy Morrissey, Jimmy's sister. special things of, of doing the Irish Honors uh, each year, uh, the Irish Honors Luncheon, is to have Tom Clifford here with us. And Tom faithfully does these videos year in and year out. Tom, how long have you been doing uh, Irish Ireland on the move? 30 years? 40. How many? 40. 40 years. And, I, you know, the, the treasure trove of archival material that he has, of the videos that he shot all these years, is just a... Uh, is just something to, to behold. Um, we have a chance to tell the stories of this year two families and one individual Boston Irish person. Um, and 
once again, people came up to me at the end of the program and said, this was the best ever, the best program ever. And I hear that story every year. The point of it is people telling the stories of the fact that we stand on the shoulders of the people who got us here. None of us are self-made people. All of us are here because we had people who came before us who sacrificed and did good things to make sure that we had a good life. That's the Boston Irish experience. I don't mean to be preaching, but it is special. Shall live, can't 